Hello friends, in our series of discussion on molecular spectroscopy, I am here to discuss today vibrational spectroscopy. The potential energy diagrams for molecules in the ground and excited electronic states are shown here and if you look closely within one of the levels, for example in the ground stage, you can see that electronic state is characterized by several vibrational levels inside and each of these vibrational level consists of several rotational levels. And energy difference between the vibrational levels corresponds to the energy of infrared radiation of the electromagnetic spectrum and therefore the infrared radiations can interact with the energy of a vibrating molecule. Infrared radiations belong to the electromagnetic spectrum in this wavelength region and consists of mainly three fractions, the far IR, middle IR and near IR. Let's now closely look at the potential energy diagram which is called Morse potential energy diagram where we have got the potential energy of the molecule described in terms of internuclear distance. So before the bond is formed you have got two atoms separated at large distance and when you are moving these atoms together closer and closer along the x-axis you can see that the energy of the system decreases and at certain internuclear distance which can be called as the equilibrium distance you have got the lowest energy situation and if you bring the two atoms further together closer and closer you can see that there is a sharp increase in energy and this equilibrium distance that is the distance the internuclear distance corresponding to the well of the potential energy diagram or the lowest energy point in the potential energy diagram corresponds to the bond length. And this difference in energy that is the situation where the two atoms are clearly separated and the two atoms form a stable bond. This energy difference gives the dissociation energy of the molecule. So the Morse potential energy diagram can tell you the equilibrium bond length and the dissociation energy of a chemical bond. And this part, the right side of the curve involves the attractive forces between the two atoms that is where you have got a decrease in energy with more and more attraction and the left side is dominated by the repulsive interaction that is when you bring the atoms together the repulsive interactions dominate to get a high energy. Now let's focus on molecular vibrations. Generally we represent the molecule like this with a rigid bond in between but actually the molecules are vibrating that means the bond between the two atoms are not rigid as shown here but the chemical bond is oscillating. A vibrating molecule is therefore assumed to be a harmonic oscillator for which the vibration is uniform throughout and the restoring force is given in terms of the force constant K and displacement X. And let's now have a look on the potential energy diagram of this harmonic oscillator. You get a perfect parabola because energies are described by a quadratic function. But we know that our molecule, the molecular potential energy diagram is not a perfect parabola. At least at the higher part of the curve it deviates from the parabolic behavior. That means the real molecules are not harmonic oscillator, they are unharmonic oscillators. But as for the regular strategy of what quantum mechanics does, we assume first the molecules to be a harmonic oscillator to make the system easier to understand and we derive the expressions for energy and see what happens during energy transitions and then we extrapolate this information onto the case of an harmonic oscillator to see the real molecules. So let's look at the harmonic oscillator consideration of molecules. Here I've got a harmonically oscillating molecule whose potential energy diagram is given by a perfect parabola. And its restoring force and the potential energy of oscillation are given in terms of the force constant and displacement during vibration. And its oscillation frequency is given by 1 by 2 pi root of k by mu where k is the force constant and mu is the reduced mass which is a combination of the two atomic masses. By solving the Hamiltonian for energy expression we reach at this equation the performance of the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian operation us note our focus for the time being. So we just extract the energy value here which is, which is given in terms of V the vibrational quantum number and nu is the frequency of oscillation. 
and the frequency of oscillation is generally expressed in a unit of centimeter inverse that is why the energy expression in the unit of centimeter inverse is given like this which is v plus half omega where omega is the oscillation frequency in centimeter inverse now let's have a look at the energy values for different vibrational energy levels with this expression in hand. So for the first vibrational quantum number V equal to 0, the calculated energy from this expression here will be half omega. That means even at this lowest vibrational level V equal to 0, the system is associated with a minimal amount of energy and this energy is called zero point energy. And for the next higher energy level V equals 1, we reach at this value 3 by 2 omega and for the next level it is 5 by 2 omega and 7 by 2 omega etc. If you go for higher and higher vibrational quantum level, you reach at higher and higher energies with the lowest energy is half omega which is a zero point energy. And now to see which are the possible transitions among these energy levels, we need to see the quantum mechanical selection rules. The gross selection rule says there should be a change in dipole moment of the molecule during vibration because the sinusoidal change in dipole moment during vibration imparts an electric field associated with the molecule and this electric field component of the molecule can interact with the electric field component of the IR radiation and that is how the molecule can absorb the IR radiation of respective energy. So looking at a homonuclear diatomic molecule, we see that during vibration there is no change in dipole moment because the molecule is non-polar, no charge separation is therein. Therefore, such molecules are IR inactive. On the other hand, if you have a heteronuclear diatomic molecule, the molecule is polar, there is a charge separation and during vibration the dipole moment changes because the dipole moment is a function of both the charge separation and the distance of separation. So during the vibrational motion the distance of separation is varying therefore the dipole moment is varying sinusoidally and this makes the molecule vibrationally active. Let's now look at the specific selection rule which talks about the possible transitions between different vibrational levels. So it says that the vibrational quantum number should change by unity. That is in case of absorption spectrum, the vibrational quantum number changes by plus 1. That is a molecule in the vibrational level 0 can excite only up to the vibrational level 1. And such a transition corresponds to energy difference omega. And if you consider the next possible transition that is V equals 1 to 2, it will also give the energy difference omega. And the next other possible translations all are associated with omega. This shows that all these energy transitions are corresponding to the same energy value omega. Or in other words, the vibrational energy levels are equally spaced by a spacing of omega units. Therefore, a given mode of vibration in a molecule results in a single absorption because all these possible energy transitions are corresponding to single value, single energy difference of omega. That's how the molecule should work if it were a harmonic oscillator. But we know that the real molecules are not harmonic oscillators. At least in the upper part of the potential energy world, we see deviations from the parabolic behavior, the harmonic behavior. The energy corresponding to the unharmonic oscillator is found to be this much, where we have got new terms in comparison to the harmonic oscillator. Here for the unharmonic oscillators, we have got new additional terms involving chi, the unharmonicity constant. And let's now look at the energy levels. So if you move higher and higher values of V, the vibrational quantum numbers, you can see that the energy levels become closer and closer space because these terms, the second and third terms here in this energy expressions dominate for higher and higher V values. You've got lower and lower energy as you move up when you compare the energy with that of a harmonic oscillator. So at least in the upper part of the well you see that energy levels are not equally spaced and accordingly there is a change in specific selection rule that 
for the enharmonic oscillator all these transitions are allowed a molecule in the lowest vibrational level can excite to any higher vibrational level so all these transitions are possible and the first transition that is from lowest vibrational level to the next higher vibrational level v equal to 0 to 1 this is called fundamental transition which corresponds to the delta v value to be unity and the other transitions of higher delta v values are called overtones where the v equal to 0 to 2 is the first overtone 0 to 3 will be the second overtone etc but the fundamental transition is the most intense transition the for the fundamental lines are the most intense lines in a ir spectra and here is an example spectrum of hydrogen chloride and the ir spectra consists of information on omega because the absorption frequency corresponds to the energy difference between the vibrational levels and we know that omega the oscillation frequency carries information on force constant k which represents nature of the chemical bond and mu the reduced mass which characterizes the atomic masses so these two together k and mu together give rise to group frequencies that is for a particular bond k and mu values together and therefore this oscillation frequency and therefore the frequency of absorption lies in a given range like this for example ch the carbon hydrogen bond in alkanes stretch within a frequency range of 3000 to 2850 cm inverse what does that mean is the CH bond in all the molecules has the same reduced mass value and similar elasticity. Why not exactly a given value is because the elasticity and the nature of the bond is affected by the neighboring atoms in the molecules. Therefore this CH bond is characterized by certain vibrations which are associated with energies in the given fixed range. We will see the different modes of vibration stretching and bending soon. Now let's look at two molecules, 1-propanol and 2-propanol. These are very similar molecules, isomers, just with the difference that the hydroxyl group in 1-propanol is placed at the first carbon and in 2-propanol it is placed at the second carbon. And therefore the IR spectra of these two molecules look very similar except for this given range. Outside this range the spectra are very similar and this range makes the spectra different. And the peaks present in this range distinguishes the two molecules. This is true for all the molecules and therefore this particular range of frequency 700 to 1400 centimeter inverse marks the fingerprint region which is unique for each molecule and this region is exclusively including all the bending vibrations. That's how IR spectra act as fingerprint of molecules and that's what makes IR spectroscopy a unique tool in structural characterization. Now let's see the different modes of vibrations in molecules. If the molecule consists of n number of atoms the total motional degrees in the three dimensional space will be 3n. Among the 3n motions, three are translational motions along the three coordinates and then there are rotational motions possible. So for a linear molecule, it can rotate about all the three axes but the rotational motion about those two axes are identical. Therefore, the linear molecule rotates in two different ways and therefore the rotational degree of freedom is 2 for the linear molecule and the remaining would be the vibrational degrees of freedom that is 3n minus 2 rotational degrees and 3 translational degrees so the total vibrational degrees of freedom for the linear molecules will be 3n minus 5 where n is the number of atoms present. On the other hand for a non-linear molecule like water the rotational motion about the 3 axis marks the 3 rotational degrees of freedom and the remaining would be 3n minus 6 vibrational degrees of freedom after the 3 rotational degrees and 3 translational degrees. So this is how you can calculate how many different vibrational modes of motions are possible for linear and non-linear molecules. And with this information in hand, let's now have a look on carbon dioxide, a linear triatomic molecule. The vibrational degrees of freedom will be 3n minus 5, that is 4 according to our calculations. So let's now see which are the four different modes of vibration 
in carbon dioxide. So let's see the first one here. The molecule can here vibrate uniformly. That is both the bones are stretching and compressing at the same time. Such a vibration is called symmetric stretching. And during symmetric stretching you can see that there is no change in dipole moment because both the bones move to the same direction at the same time. So this particular mode of motion does not give rise to a change in dipole moment. Therefore the molecule is IR inactive according to our gross selection rule. And the next mode would be the asymmetric stretching like this. That is when one of the bond is compressing the other is getting stretched. Such a non-uniform vibration, this asymmetric mode of vibration give rise to a change in dipole moment. Therefore, this mode of vibration is IR active. And the third mode of vibration is a bending vibration like this where the bond angle is changing. This is the symmetric bending and this is also called scissoring. And during this scissoring motion, the dipole moment of the molecule changes making the mode of vibration IR active. And the fourth mode of vibration is bending out of the plane like this and during this vibration again the dipole moment changes so this vibration is also IR active. And these two bending motions are degenerate that means they are associated with the same amount of energy. So the linear molecule carbon dioxide has got four modes of vibrations among which two are stretching and two are bending vibrations. The stretching vibrations involve a change in bond length during vibration whereas bending involves a change in bond angle. And among the four the symmetric stretching vibration is IR inactive because it does not give rise to a change in dipole moment whereas all the other three vibrations are IR active because they are associated with a change in dipole moment and the two bending vibrations are degenerate. Here is how the spectrum of carbon dioxide looks. Among the two peaks the higher energy one corresponds to the asymmetric stretching and the lower energy one corresponds to the symmetric bending. And now let's see the vibrations in water the nonlinear triatomic molecule. For the nonlinear molecule the vibrational degrees of freedom will be 3 and minus 6. So for water molecules we expect three different modes of vibrations. Let's now see which are the three modes of vibration. Here shown us symmetric stretching that is both the bones are stretching at the same time and compressing at the same time. And as it is a nonlinear molecule the symmetric stretching give rise to a change in dipole moment making the mode of vibration IR active. And looking at the asymmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching is IR active because there is a change in dipole moment during the motion. And coming to the bending vibration, it looks like this with a change in bond angle during vibration and a change in dipole moment occurs and therefore all the three motions in water molecules are IR active where two are stretching vibrations and one is a bending vibration. And this is how the spectrum of water molecule look where symmetric bending lies in the lower energy region whereas the two stretching motions are in the higher energy region. And now let's see how an infrared spectrometer looks. Thanks to Bruker for the image and the major components of the spectrometer involve an infrared source and the radiation is split using a beam splitter and through the mirrors the radiations are led to a sample cell and to a reference cell and at this sample cell and the reference cell based on the possible vibrations inside and on the IR activity of the vibration the respective energies are absorbed and the transmitted light is then directed to a splitter and then through the detector and then the analysis unit collects and processes the data. So that's concisely about the principles behind infrared spectroscopy and before closing I would just like to leave a note there the greenhouse gases all the greenhouse gases are IR active molecules because then only they can absorb the infrared radiations going out of the earth's surface. So the IR activity of molecules and greenhouse effect are related. So with this let me close the session and the next big thing to come up is a Raman spectroscopy. Thank you.